Howdy, and welcome back to part three of our interview with Dr. Joshua Swamidas from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, he is in town for the Veritas Forum uh, this evening. Well, actually, by the time you listen to this, it'll be long, long, long past, but um, he will be in conversation with Dr. Uh, Michael Behe on evolution, intelligent design, and all of that stuff. Now, as you learned in our previous two interviews, uh, evolution is a much bigger picture than just the Darwinian flattened down version that you hear uh, typically young earth creationists are objecting to, or even the ID people. Um, now, in this conversation... And we also found out that Jesus is greater than all of And this. Jesus is and bigger than all of And he was far them. more fun to talk right. about. Yes, yes, that is true. So, on that, uh, you have a new book called The Genealogical Adam and Eve. And the... Uh, I mean, the, uh, the so, log line is pretty good. It's uh, scientist shows that overlooked science uh, proves that Adam and Eve are compa uh, literal Adam and Eve are compatible with evolution. Boom! That's that's a big uh, big deal. So I want to talk much more about this. So in short, what is the genealogical Adam and Eve? Yeah. So I show how these two origin stories that engage the grand question of what it means to be human that we get from scripture and from science can be entirely compatible. That there's no actual conflict, and I mean that in a particular way because. I mean, obviously that's true if Adam and Eve are mythical, but that's not what I mean. What I mean mm -hmm. is if Adam and Eve are real people in a real past that exist recently, less than 10,000 years ago, that they're de novo created out of the dust in the rib without parents special, mm -hmm. by a special act of creation, miraculous direct creation, and that they're ancestors of everyone. Okay. All three of those things could be true at the same time as these key findings of evolutionary science, which I mean specifically and merely at the, in this case, common descent, which means that we share common ancestry with the great apes and that the population of our ancestors never dips down to a single couple. Okay. And the way how it gets resolved is by remembering that that traditional account includes mystery. There's always been a mystery in the Genesis tradition about what's outside the garden, suggested by scripture, wondered about by many people for thousands of years, has nothing to do with evolution. Mm -hmm. That's just what the Genesis account is. And so the possibility is that maybe that what scientists is telling us about is about these people outside the garden. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that eventually interbred with Adam and, Eve, Adam and Eve's lineage. And scripture is telling us the story of Adam and Eve and mm -hmm. their descendants. Mm -hmm. And in that case, both could be true. So how exactly does that work that, they, that Adam and Eve created a couple thousand years ago can be the ancestors of everyone on the planet today? Yeah, it turns out that uh, our best science shows that and just takes a few thousand years for really just about anyone to become ancestors of everyone. And that might sound surprising. A lot of people think I'm talking about mitochondrial Eve or, mito or Y chromosome Adam who arise more ancient than 100,000 years ago. I'm not talking about that. Uh, the key point is that Adam and Eve, uh, we probably don't get our Y chromosome and what I mitochondrial, mitochondria from them. Or none of us do, probably. And, you know, the common ancestor for that genetic piece of our genome, that, that, that part of our genome, that arises really anciently from the people outside the garden. But Adam and Eve are genealogical ancestors. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think that is probably like the key thing to take away is when people say evolution, quote, rules out Adam and Eve or, quote, disproves Adam and Eve, what they really mean is what you said about the population never dips down to below two people. But that doesn't say anything about with the, what the Bible said. The well, Bible it's a category yeah. here. Yeah. So it's an equivocation, or, or it may be just a mix-up. Mm -hmm. It can be equivocation or mix-up, but it's a category error. That's what it yeah. is between genetic ancestry yeah, and, and so. genealogical ancestry. It's also a category between the traditional account and denying people outside the garden. The traditional account of Genesis does not deny people outside the garden. It's a category uh, error to think that Scripture denies the people outside the garden. So when you say biblical account, well... We can demonstrate from history that people have been wondering about the people outside the garden for a long, long time. And it had nothing to do with evolution. In fact, the biggest challenge to it doesn't come even from evolution or deep time, just the geographic spread mm -hmm. of people across the earth. When people discovered the new world and found out there was people inhabiting it, they didn't really know what to make of it. Mm -hmm. That was the first major serious challenge to the doctrine of monogenesis, the idea that we all descend from Adam and Eve. Yeah. So building off of that monogenesis idea... Um, the uh, it, it seems like this view of Adam and Eve being uh, de novo created, you know, outside of the garden and then interbreeding with these other humans leaves open some dangerous doors. In particular, uh, 
many people will point out that evolutionary theory was wielded by the eugenics people for a while to talk about how we're not all one human race, we're actually separate human races. Well, so there's several things collapsed there I want to pull yeah. out. First of all, uh, geneticists at the time showed that evolutionary science did not actually support eugenic claims. Okay. So uh, that, that's actually fairly important. And the science of that's actually interesting. <laughs> Um, but it turns out that eugenics, uh, as it was understood at the time when it was there, could not actually have worked. And this is important because Doc can actually just said, well, you know, <laughs> in a tweet recently that, you know, eugenics actually yeah. works. But, he, but whatever he means by eugenics is not, I mean, once again, this is like this whole, you know, young earth creationists have their pseudo history. ID has its pseudo history. And apparently Dawkins does too. So, <laughs> okay. So, you know, yeah. there, there's an issue here. It's just not actually consistent with evolutionary science. Now. I would say that eugenicists did appeal both to scripture and to science to justify their eugenic claims. And also uh, racists did the same thing too. What we find out as we look at the history is that origins is actually important because it brings us to this question about what it means to be human. And one answer that is incorrect that you can come away with is maybe that we're not all equally human or we're all different sorts of humans and all that. And maybe um, we should do these sorts of things that are horribly wrong. Now, we, we need to understand from that is that that's why this is important. That's why we need to engage and we need to understand our history, the conversation we're entering, so, uh, so that we can receive the inheritance that's here, this inheritance of, of racism, both in theology and in science, to understand it, to accept that's what we're inheriting, and to find ways to do better. And what really helps us is that good theology and scripture and good science all bring us to the same conclusion, that we're all the same family. Mm -hmm. There's only one race, the human race, and we all descend from Adam and Eve if they exist. That's what all three of those things tell us. They're, yeah, they all converge on that, that same point. Um, that, just for, for uh, clarification, historically the doctrine of monogenesis was used as a bulwark against uh, racism. But the genealogical hypothesis kind of, as I understand it, uh, doesn't affirm monogenesis. No, it does. Oh, it does? Oh, it does affirm monogenesis. Yeah, you read the book. Yeah, I did read the book. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it turns yeah. out that there's many ways to define monogenesis. So, so yeah, that's what I mean. I'm, the traditional, I'm importing my presuppositions here. Well, no, the traditional ways say that we all descend from Adam and Eve. It, and I'm saying making okay. no statements about people outside the garden. So... Um, you can look at several test cases to show that, that the key issue was whether or not there are people that, descend, that do not descend from Adam and Eve alive right now outside the, go, the, the, the garden. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, outside across the globe. Yeah. That's the part that theology denied. Okay. They, they never denied that maybe, you know, Nephilim interbred somehow with, with humans I in the you. past. Or all that. that was never considered, that was never actually on the table. A lot of people thought that was nonsense, but also a lot of people wondered about it. You know, you can even see that in, you know, the Ark Encounter by Ken Ham, where mm -hmm. they have like a diorama of a, like a, a like gladiators in a, in a Colosseum mm -hmm. and with the giants. Those giants are supposed to be the Nephilim, like these, yeah. uh, these uh, interbreeding people, these people that have been made by interbreeding with Adam and, e Adam and Eve's lineage. Mm -hmm. Also, like in the Catholic tradition, um, Ken, uh, Kenneth Kemp has talked about monogenesis uh, out of a, it, from within a population in this way, too. So, yes, what I'm talking about affirms monogenesis, monogenesis, meaning that we all descend from Adam and Eve. Okay, I may have misunderstood, because you used another term in there, um, which was, mo I think it was monophyletic, was that the Yeah, word so this said? is the place where I made a mistake. So my okay. use of the terms monophyletic and mono polyphyletic are not precisely correct. Um, and I'm actually about to write an article on that, okay. uh, um, explaining that, that mistake. But I would just drop those two rooms until I write that article. It'll make a little more sense. Okay, okay. I think that I may have just gotten my wires crossed on that, on, yeah. on that one. But um, I talked about monophylogeny and polyphylogeny. Yeah. So, so polyphylogeny, that's like the ground of the racism that people are opposing, correct? Yeah, so racism arises where you see, well, first of all, to be clear, this isn't a necessarily racist point of view. You could say that different types of humans you know, arose either by creation or by evolution across the globe uh, that are distinct. You could say that. Now, it just turns out to be false, but you could say that. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily tell you that there's different levels of humanity. It doesn't tell you that there's different levels of human worth and dignity and rights and rules. It doesn't tell you any of that, right? And that's not necessarily racist. So you see an image of that world in Star Trek. Yeah, for sure. Where you see a polygenesis world because every planet has species that are sentient 
with equal rights and human dignity, even though maybe they have different technologies for understandable reasons that don't have to do with their worth and dignity. Um, across the globe and all the different you know, na nations are really just from different planets, have different origins. So that's one view of the world and it's not racist. I mean, you can tell because William Schlatner's out there sleeping with all the women. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, the story, there was a morality story happening there because at that time people did think that the world was polygenesis. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they're doing that, they're trying to challenge the notion of that it's wrong for different races to interbreed. And that's why there's like the very first on-screen kiss, interracial kiss, was between Ohura yeah. and Bill Shatner because they were making they were making a political statement of saying even if we're all different biologically, because that's what everyone thought, yeah. we're all the same. So it's not necessarily racist, right? Mm -hmm. and, and remember that th this came out in the '60s, right? <laughs> and so that's like the commentary they're making, which is a really profound commentary right mm -hmm. but that's why he's sleeping with a woman all over the place it's not because he has poor morals per se but because they're trying to make a point does that make sense yeah for sure excellent exegesis of uh star trek if i say so myself <laughs> but the thing about what we find out is that that picture of the world is completely wrong mm -hmm. it turns out that in fact matching uh what historical theology has said you know that scientists and we only figured this out recently probably in the 70s so yeah. you know if um, you know, if Star Trek was actually started in the 70s, this probably wouldn't have been as important. In fact, it isn't. Like, if you get into the, like, the 70s and the 80s, you don't see the guys sleeping around. Like, yeah. the, that's not happening anymore because that's, that's not the driving thing anymore. Yeah. And so, because that, that's not a key thing, but that's out, that was really central to it initially. But basically what you find out is that in the 70s, and Alan Templeton is one of the population geneticists that, or, that endorsed the book, who was a key part of this, they basically showed that we're all one race. This, this idea of being multiple races is false. Turns out that there are there is multiple races of chimpanzees. That is fascinating. But there is not w multiple races of humans. Isn't that amazing? Remarkable. I, I literally did not know that. I don't even... Actually, I want to make a meta point here. Sure. So you kind of said, well, we got this problem about racism, worried, right? Yeah. I mean, you didn't mean it that way, but some people do, kind of perseverating. Yeah. But then what happened? We just had like, some amazing conversations looking at what it means to be human. Mm -hmm. And not just from science, but also from theology. And, and that exchange, that dialogue, that was a fun conversation, wasn't it? Yeah. And, so yeah. is it really a problem? Actually, I think what it is, is that's actually what the joy of this is, where you actually engage these grand questions mm -hmm. in conversation with our real history to understand them better. And that's actually what the purpose of this book really is about. Yeah, o opening up those conversations. Um, now, on that, I do think there is a little bit of a limit to how far the conversation uh, is opened uh, for some people, because your book... Um, claims, or it doesn't really claim, but it goes a long way to open up conversation between theistic evolutionists way over here and young earth creationists that well, are maybe. way Well, maybe. I mean, yeah. I don't know if I would say it that way, but go ahead. At least on the Adam and Eve question uh, in, in particular. Okay. In, in theory, you could actually have someone who is a theistic evolutionist and a young earth creationist agree on the first three chapters of Genesis. Just about. Just well, what, about. Well, so I think a better way to put it is that even atheists are part of the conversation. Oh, yeah, for Older sure. Older I think we could all get to the point of agreeing mm -hmm. what mainstream science says is possible. Okay. All right. That, That's different. That so sense. it's not just this. I think this is like yeah. a, there's no reason that within, you know, three or four years that everyone wouldn't agree that this is possible. And it's funny. The people who say it's not possible tend to be people who are actually outside mainstream science because they don't want it to be possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then their, their cottage industry goes away, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it takes away a serious, uh, you know, you know, a serious theological objection mm -hmm. to, to evolution. And, you know, actually several of them. Yeah. So, so I think it's more than just theist. I'm not even a theistic evolutionist myself. I'm just right. a Christian that affirms evolution. Yeah, I got you. Um, so it's, it's more than just them. It's also older creationists, like reasons to believe in others. And it's also mm -hmm. atheist scientists, too. Like, you know, this is something that really all of us should care about that because we all care about this question about what it means to be human. We all should care about reducing societal conflict. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, you know, and there's no reason not to agree about what's possible. Right. So one thing I, that I do think, to put it, I guess, less than charitably, is um, what this problem or what this book and your proposal does is effectively move the battle lines away from Adam and Eve and shifts it up later in the Genesis narrative. Because there are certain hypotheses associated with the, uh, I'll throw a new word at you, neo Asherian. Uh, and this is the idea of you take Bishop Usher's chronology. Oh, and, yeah, yeah. So if you do that. So you and, and then marry it also with some yeah. independent hypotheses, such as a planetary tower of Babel and a planetary flood and the idea of flood geology. If you marry all of that together, you get 
contemporary American. Yeah, uh, so you stuff, actually yeah. explained the exact issue. Yeah, so yeah. It's a very idiosyncratic, mm -hmm. meaning particular, yeah. very recent reading of Genesis. So yeah, can you construct a reading of, Gen a reading of Genesis that's in conflict with evidence? Of course you can. It takes a lot of work, and it turns out people have done that work. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. the thing about it is that that's actually, that is actually a departure from the Genesis tradition. Okay. And so what that does is that just makes it clearer. And so what it does is it really, really reshuffles it. And what's interesting is you're saying it shifts the battle lines to Genesis 1, but there's an important thing about the battle lines in Genesis 1. They've all already been resolved. Mm -hmm. So a great example of that is what's happened in Ratio Christi. You guys are a classic example because you actually have young earth creationists alongside old earth creationists. So the young earth creationists think the earth is young, but they're saying that I'm willing to at least tolerate this old earth creationist because we have enough in common. That these questions about Genesis 1 are not important enough for me to disassociate from them. Ecclesially, the debate between old earth creationists and young earth creationism is a solved problem. Mm -hmm. So you can't actually shift the battle lines there without getting rid of the battle. Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that be a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Because if there's a way to affirm evolutionary science, mm -hmm. even if you disagree with certain types of evolutionary creation, if you can agree, if there's a way to affirm evolutionary science within the confines of Ratio Christi, mm -hmm. there's now no longer any reason to fight about it. Mm -hmm. There is now no longer any condemnation from your young earth creationist. Friends. And wouldn't that be beautiful? It, it really would be, yeah. Now, one thing, though, that I do think will be uh, some uh, neo Asherian creationist types that I think they'll be hesitant about is that the other big thing besides literal Adam and Eve is like flood geology. And that, and and basically the idea that uh, all of humanity funneled down all the way to you know a family of about eight people, depending on how many people are on on Noah's Ark. So I think that uh, your genealogical hypothesis, I think it's I think it's fair to say that uh, recent science has demonstrated that. Oh, but that's also yeah. easy to solve too. Yeah. So, so the question of Adam. So for example, I talk about a genealogical Adam, but if you really want to, you could take a genealogical Noah. Okay. So, I mean, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't alter really anything. So we just move back the timeline, uh, depending on what gap you mm -hmm. want to put between Adam and Noah. I mean, so some old earth creationists have even proposed the idea that Adam and Eve are, you know, at the origin of Homo sapiens, and then yeah. Noah is recent. Interesting. So that is a possibility. Now, um, you know, it all really comes, I mean, there's just like a lot of possibilities yeah. here now. Uh, but I'll tell you, the way how Genesis teaches it, I think that's the key thing. What's important yeah. is not what young earth creationists say about Genesis, but what Genesis says about itself. I think that should be our starting point. When you read Genesis, it doesn't talk about a global flood. It cannot possibly be teaching a global flood. It also does not talk about Homo sapiens across the globe. It talks about the descendants of Adam and Eve in the area of the Aretz or that land. So it's talking about, it's talking literally, I mean, if a literal reading is important, it's talking about a literal destruction of the civilization of Adam and Eve in that area without really discussing the globe. And without really discussing people who weren't Adam and Eve descendants, or not discussing people who were Adam and Eve descendants outside that area. So if a literal reading of, of Genesis is important, it's not clear at all what the fight is about. Now, of course, if you want to add to it the human words that this must be a global flood, well then, yeah, you got a problem, but what does that have to do with scripture? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it, it's a separate exegetical question at that point. Um, well, it's not even exegetical. The idea of a global flood does not exist in the church, you know, very recently because the idea of a globe didn't exist till very recently. <laughs> I mean, no, there's a globe to be clear, but never people on the other side. Right. Right. Yeah. And so so it, it it would almost seem wasteful from that point of view of an ancient person. It's not necessary. Person. Yeah. It's not necessary. You... And so, you know, they would, it's just not, it's just a category error, once again. A category error to think that Genesis teaches a global flood. It doesn't, it doesn't teach that. Yeah. Um, one other thing that may be of a concern for this genealogical hypothesis is, um, you, you point out in the book that Adam and Eve don't start off as the ancestors of everyone, but they become the ancestors of everyone at a later point in time. So everyone today currently alive um, is uh, our, we all have shared ancestry with, with, with Adam and Eve. So um, presumably there was a time period where not everyone living on the planet was, uh, they were of mixed ancestry, some outside the garden 
ancestors and some with Adam and Eve. And then at some point later, everyone alive now is at that point. Am I summarizing that correctly? Descendants from both people outside the garden and yeah. Adam and Eve. Yeah. So the, the question is, like, how do we deal with that? Well, a key thing to remember is that, you know, we have to be careful about saying, for example, humans equals homo sapiens. So when it talks about mankind in scripture or humankind in scripture, it's not talking about homo sapiens. Homo right. sapiens is be. a very recent concept that term arises recently. It's not even well designed in science. In, in, you know, and actually even most young creationists don't even think that's the right way to define human anyways. They would say the homo genus. So, but even that's a scientific term. We have to come up, I mean, so Genesis does not say the homo genus arises, it says mankind. We have to ask like, well, how does scripture define it? Well. Everyone across the debate, including young earth creationists, and well, not everyone, I guess there are evolutionary creationists that kind of go a strange way, but older earth creationists, defines human by scripture as Adam and Eve and their descendants. Yeah, that makes sense. And so this isn't talking about whether or not really, it's, this isn't to deny the humanness or humanity of people outside, but to say that the humans of scripture are Adam and Eve and their descendants. And so if that's how you define human for the technical purpose of understanding what scripture is addressing that arises as a single couple without anyone in that group appearing before adam and eve or alongside adam and eve and only arises by genealogical descent by them and it's just purely like a hermeneutical theological fact that humans of scripture are adam and eve and all and all their descendants that include everyone across the globe by 81 but it doesn't really make any statement about people in the past okay so I guess the, the question, we were actually discussing this earlier off, offline. Uh, passages such as like Acts 17, where Paul says that uh, from one man God fixed the... Well, from uh, one. Or from one, right, yeah, from one uh, uh, God fixed the boundaries of the earth. Or they, uh, are no, from one God created all the nations. Or created all the nations. And set down the boundaries. Uh, yeah, 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 I got you. So uh, commonly that has been interpreted as Paul saying that uh, from Adam are all the nations that are on the earth. Well, today. also Noah. Some people have said yeah, or Noah. Noah, right? Yeah. So I mean, and we find out that that's true. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 yeah. So so it is true. So the question. That, I mean, you know, if they exist, I mean, we don't know from science that Adam and Eve exist. Right. We know is that if they exist, that that's true. That, right. That that's true. The question that I have is, how would Paul know that in in his argument, or the people that he's talking to, though? Like, how how would he know that at the point that he's talking? the family of Adam and Eve had expanded to include everyone that was alive at, at that time. Well, um, to be clear, his concept of the world was different than ours. Okay, fair enough. So, he, so when he says all the people, you know, he's not thinking about Tasmania, he's not thinking about the Americas, he's not even thinking about China, he's not thinking about Japan, he's not thinking about any of these things. And you might wonder, well, wait a minute, why isn't he thinking about them? Well, it's because he didn't know about them. Okay, so when they talk about the world, they're not talking about anything else. Though I do think it's a valid theological, in hindsight, inference, especially because it's not Paul who says it, it's Jesus who says it in the ascension, take my, uh, you know, the gospel to the ends of the world, ends of the earth, you know, in, in his, you know, post-resurrection form. I think it's a fairly reasonable theological inference that he thinks that. And if Paul thinks then, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that Adam and Eve uh, descent from Adam and Eve is somehow relevant to the gospel, as, for example, Augustine did, and the church tradition after that. Then it's reasonable to think that that you know, for this very temporally defined question of how far should we send out the gospel, that at that time, so it's defined in time. Well, at that time, I think we should. I think that's one reasonable place to put down a marker and say that everyone descends from Adam and Eve. Okay. Yeah. That. Tra it tracks with me. And um, to be clear, you could make a case that it could have even been later for the Americas, right? Mm -hmm. Because the gospel didn't re reach there until later. Right, yeah, until 15. It's just that yeah. you could already get to 6,000 years. I mean, at a certain point, you have to wonder, like, how early do we need to have Adam and Eve? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know if there's any young earth creationists that think it has to be more recent than 6,000 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know of anyone? I don't. So there's no point in even going that path, but yeah. I do think that there's cases to be made. So I, I do actually have this exact question about the, the Americas. So um, I've actually had the privilege of working uh, for a couple of years now on some projects um, on related to the first Americans, so the, the first people to come to, to North uh, and South America. 
There's um, a debate about when that is. So what time were you? So thinking? there is a debate. So the Clovis people arrived, I think, about thirteen thousand years ago, and the debate is whether there are, um, you know, whether there were people before that. And there's, I think, at this point, pretty sound evidence to show that at least a thousand, two thousand years before that, there are, there are people in the Americas. So maybe fourteen, fifteen thousand years ago. Um, there's actually, I think, remains discovered. Um, uh, like I don't know, in the last few months um, that have been published. Um, so uh, kind of, I, you know, prior to a couple of years ago, I wasn't in this, this area of study at all. But now that I've been exposed to it, real, you know, realizing there's a lot of evidence kind of for the timeline of, of arrival of people in the, in the Americas. So how does that interact with this particular version of the genealogical hypothesis? Well, with, so, with so you're talking about when the recent. first come, but the real question is rather whether or not there remained exchanges. And so ancient DNA is giving us a lot of evidence of exchanges. So that, that's how it interacts. So it's not about saying that these are the first people in Americas, but rather that the people in America didn't just go there and then cut off ties and there was no exchanges. And, mm -hmm. and it turns out that, you know, there's good reason to think that there was a broken bridge from along the islands and along the coast, continuously accessible and and not to go back and check exactly, and you know, I mean, like ancient DNA is a pretty evolving field. Sometimes claims get published that end up kind of get challenged and things like that, and whatever. But there, but there seems to be genetic evidence. The last time I checked, though, I'm going to put a big asterisk on that right now. That that there was actually exchanges too, and uh, and so that that's that's all you need. There, you, you have to rule out the idea that there wasn't exchanges. Mm -hmm to show that there's evidence against this. And that's all I'm claiming is that there's evidence against this. If you can't show evidence against it, then it's the most likely, it's the most likely thing. So I guess my question is, so in, in the case where you have um, a recent, recent um, Adam and Eve on the genealogical hypothesis, you have some bottleneck there, right? So you, you have, um, you know, the bulk of people arrive in North America before Adam and Eve, and then the exchange is, like, there's a much, the bottleneck of exchange between North America and the rest. It's much smaller than the... Oh, yeah, yeah, but that's fine. But it's, a, but it's not a bottleneck in population because it just takes one successful immigrant. And then that that one, that's sufficient to, within, you know, a couple thousand years, genealogically yeah, then be related like to the whole population. Yeah, it's just like yeast and bread. You know, it's, so it's like an exponential explosion, so... Yeah, I, I mean, this happens whenever you're, you get married. Like, whenever you get married, you literally double the size of your genealogy for your kids. And then they get married and that quadruples. Yeah, so so if yeah. you're just replacing yourself, right? So if every time you get married, if every couple, like, just replaces themselves and produces exactly two kids, and let's just take away, like, let's say everyone gets married and does that, mm -hmm. then it's an exponential expansion. Like, you know, it just doubles every generation, essentially. So how long does it take one immigrant then to be genealogically related to a whole popula population? Presumably there's a calculation for that. Yeah, I put it in the book. So it just turns out to be the log. It tends to be proportional to the log of the population size. So then for a relatively small population in North America, for example, one immigrant could become genealogically related in, you know, just a handful of generations. Yeah, there's a couple things that actually, um, I mean, so... Amer the Americas are pretty lightly populated, but uh, there's good reason to think that there are people are traveling very far distances along the coasts and dispersing really broadly there. Um, I mean, the other, I mean, another piece of indirect evidence is that you know cities arise at about the same time across the entire globe. It's not a genetic change. It's not really. Uh, I mean, it's a cultural technological change. That could have happened a lot earlier, but for some reason it happens almost simultaneously across the globe at the same time. So how did that happen? Not, not, not exactly the same. We're talking about within just a couple thousand years of one another. I mean, it didn't arise 10,000 years ago in America. It didn't arise, you know. And so, like, how did that happen? And so that, that, raises, that raises questions, too. So, I mean, these are all indirect pieces of evidence, too, for, for cultural exchange. And if there's cultural exchange, there's going to be DNA exchange. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fairly reasonable uh, inference. So um, I think uh, the, the next thing to discuss that would be real handy is kind of, and you've already alluded to this some, but what, what kind of is your goal with this book? You've talked about opening up space for conversation. Wh what do you hope happens next with this now? Oh, I want to see a conversation grow. And, I, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how different people and organizations reconfigure. 
So how do you see that playing out over the next few years? I mean, obviously, you've you've tried to kind of enter in this debate without, um, you know, severely alienating any of the multiple sides, you know, from the, the more, uh, you know, atheistic perspective all the way to the young earth perspective. You tr you've tried to keep those, you know, minimum amount of animosity, but how do you, how do you really see that playing out? I think that there's going to be people of peace that rise up that want to do the work of peacemaking. And I think also those people who do that work will find out that the work of peacemaking creates conflict <laughs> in the short term, <laughs> but it's worth it. And that, you know, there's, you know, blessed are the peacemakers because they're going to inherit the war earth. <laughs> you know, in the end, that's where the arc of history is going towards. These things are not important as a fight. But they are important for bringing us back to engaging the grand, grand questions together and inviting people of all sorts, even people who are not Christians to the table, atheists and agnostics and Jewish people and Muslims, to really sit down and think about these grand questions together. That's too valuable. It's too important to get caught up in the in, in what we see now. So you know, you know, you're younger than me. You know, I'm um, I'm 41. You guys are maybe half a generation behind me, and then. A lot of the people listening to this might actually really be a generation, you know, after me. I, you got to look ahead and see, like, where do you want things to be 20 years from now? Do you want it to be better than what it is currently? And I think, I think right now there's an opportunity for a better way. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Schwamidas. This will wrap up our third part of the, the interview. Um, again, the book is The Genealogical Adam and Eve. I personally highly recommend it. I give it 4.8 out of 5 stars. Uh, I was <laughs> going to give it 5, but apparently there's an error about the phylogeny uh, terminology. Oh, but that's being corrected. Oh, okay, okay. 4.8 as is, uh, 5 out of 5 with the uh, correction. Um, so thank you again for your time, uh, Dr. Swamidas. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode. Think Theism is made in association with Rasha Christi at Texas A&M University. We invite you to join the weekly Russia Christie meetings every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. The views and opinions that are expressed in all of our episodes are of the speakers only and are not necessarily endorsed by Russia Christie nor by Texas A&M University. For more information, go to thinktheism.org.